Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I am Lisa Kachara. Um, Tom is on YouTube in the chat. So if you see me, I did not clone myself. Uh, he's actually answering questions in the chat, but welcome. Um, today we're I'm going to talk about nature photography, bird photography, night photography. Um, Tom and I do all of this together. So we uh, actually met through photography and we really enjoy doing this. Um, we are both OM system ambassadors. We also lead tours and we lead tours for wild side tours as well. Um, we love photography. We love almost all aspects of photography. Um, if there's a question that you don't get answered today, please feel free to contact us afterward as well. I know sometimes people think of a question later on. Um, I did also put a QR code up here. So if you want to sign up, we do a monthly newsletter. Um, it's pretty short. Um, and um, I put our Instagram up here as well as uh, the actual link to our photo list as well. So we're in for kind of a really nice treat today. I have a plethora of different things that I'm going to present today. Um, Tom and I just love, as I said, most aspects of photography. Um, we do pretty much every genre except storms. We don't do lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, but pretty much everything else we just love to be able to do. And people ask, what's our favorite subject? It's typically the one that we're photographing at the moment. We've also published two books with Amherst Media, and we're working on a few others, and we like to be able to keep really busy as well. If you do happen to go to our website, you'll see that there's a wide variety of different material that we have. We do a whole abandoned and urban exploration. We do a lot of night photography, macro photography, pretty much all genres of uh, nature, uh, flower, fauna. Um, we just love being able to kind of capture what we see and to be able to share with other people how to be able to take better pictures as well. We do lead tours and we also do one-on-one -on -one workshops as well. Um, we do them in person and via Zoom and we have a lot of fun inspiring other people to do um, better photography as well. Some of the things that we'll be talking about are going to be kind of branched into two kind of uh, different types of material. So one is going to be kind of some basic things as far as inspiration goes, as far as the ability to see with our camera and to be able to freeze time and see the unseen. We can talk about time as one of our variables that we have in photography. Of course, photography is all about light and time. Um, talk about macro and close-ups. Um, the idea that we can slow down and actually pay attention to things that we see that we might just pass by, if not for the fact that we have a camera. Um, how do we find subject matter? You know, How do we get inspiration? How do we inspire other people to be able to do things? How do we pick a subject? Uh, we recently did a workshop at Longwood Gardens with thousands and thousands and thousands of tulips. Like, how do you pick which flower you're going to photograph? We look for ones that kind of tell stories. We look for characters. I'm also going to perhaps introduce two terms that you may or may not be familiar with, wabi-sabi and pareidolia. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then you'll see scattered um, in here is going to be some tech computational technology. So photography, even our uh, smartphones are doing computational photography with live time, with HDR, with uh, content to wear. There's a lot of things going on. And now our cameras can even do that more. A lot of cameras now can sensor shift. Um, I, Tom and I use live neutral density quite a bit. We are completely addicted to live time and live composite. And in fact, live composite was the reason that we switched over. Both of us were Canon users for decades and decades. We had somebody that came on a workshop with us and they were using live composite and it just floored us. Um, that was in 2016. And we just spontaneously went out and got these cameras. And then the Canon cameras really never came out of the closets again. And we uh, sold everything and just completely embraced all this computational technology. Um, our camera now, um, the model that we're using has a starry night um, autofocus that really makes night photography so much easier. Um, the bird AI is just amazing to be able to use, and I'll talk about the quite quite a bit. And there were some questions that got pre-populated regarding that as well. I'll talk about focus stacking and pro capture as well. So this is going to have a wide variety of different things. Some of it are going to be very simple things. Some of them are going to be very technical things. So there's going to be kind of something for everybody. Um, just looking at these two pictures here. Both of these pictures kind of show what a lot of our images are and that they have nice clean backgrounds and lots of detail in our subject matter. 
But we also are both tend to be drawn to uh, flowers and subjects where the background is kind of a complementary color, kind of colors at opposite ends of the color wheel. So yellow against blue, reds against greens. You'll see that quite often when we're picking a subject. Again, we go someplace, there's millions of different compositions. We both tend to be drawn to these kind of really vibrant colors at opposite ends of the color wheel. So it's something that kind of think about what kind of color scheme do you like? Are you kind of like monochrome where you pick a brown leaf out of brown car or do you kind of go for that opposite and try to find colors at opposite end of the color wheel and find an orange leaf and kind of put that up against a blue car there so kind of think about what you're drawn to and look at the pictures you're taking and see if there might be a theme that's involved in it um, again these opposite ends of the color wheel it's just something you'll see over and over again in our work and um, there's no right or wrong to it it's just kind of like a moth to a flame it's what often draws us to a particular subject to be able to photograph this and not that when we have all these choices at our disposal we'll also talk about finding characters we're all always looking for things that are different so I'll add a whole bed of flowers I'm looking for the one that looks like the bunny rabbit or I'm looking for that one that is half yellow half orange I'm looking around I don't just stop and see the first flower that I'm going to then stop and photograph and we even had one day where Tom and I went to a field of daffodils um, Laurel Ridge here in Connecticut and it just you know gazillions of daffodils and he went one way and I went the other way and we came home and we actually both photographed a same flower and it was really fascinating but it was because it was different now if you had said we'll pay you money and you have to go find the same flower there's no way in a field of flowers we would have found that but we actually kind of like the same types of looking for things that are characters looking for things that are different just like in our friends, we want you know people that have character. We don't want boring friends. So we look for that in our subject matter as well. We look for things that are inviting. This tool of one petal reaching out and inviting us over to be able to photograph it. All the rest of them, kind of like the Stepford Wives, all completely identical in this bed. And this one just welcoming us over there. And um, we're looking for, again, the background is just as important. Oftentimes we might pick a background first and then find an interesting subject to be able to put in that background. Because if the background is horrific, it doesn't matter sometimes how great your subject matter is as well. Looking at wabi-sabi. So as I mentioned, this might be a new term for some of you, but this is basically this idea that things that are imperfect, things that are aged are still just as beautiful. So this old leaf that was just hanging on into January when all the other leaves had fallen off in October and November, this one petal that is hanging on to this tulip, um, this idea that things that aren't perfect and young and beautiful are still just as beautiful. So wabi-sabi traditionally is a Japanese art of imperfect beauty, but it also can be a way of living that kind of finds beauty in everything that we see in imperfections in life and kind of just accepting all the cycles. I think as photographers, we often love to be able to look at the seasons for that as well. Wabi-sabi to me is a wonky homegrown carrot. I love the word wonky. I think Tom and I are both always looking for subject matter that are wonky. Wabi-sabi is a crack in a ceramic bowl, a well-thumbed book, a falling cherry blossom, a worn wooden hallway. It's like an appreciation of just things that are, you know, simple and different and perhaps not perfect. And it can be really uplifting to be able to kind of embrace this. So you'll see some of that scattered in here as well. I'll talk about macro photography. So um, Tom and I uh, both uh, love our macro lenses. Um, we've been using the 60 millimeter macro lens for many years. And now since January, the new 90 millimeter macro lens, which we are completely addicted to, and the poor 60 isn't coming out of the closet very much or out of the camera bag very much anymore. But even within macro, we have kind of a close up of a flower on the left hand side. And you can see one of these just kind of growing a little bit faster and a little bit reaching out further than all the rest of them and then just kind of looking more close at that particular one and getting in and kind of doing a one-to-one -one life size on that and getting an even closer on there. You'll see a term in here as well called focus stacking and I'll talk about that. Um, we are both pretty addicted to focus stacking where we can get a really nice clean background and have all of our subject matter be sharp. So you'll see a lot of that in this presentation as well. So we went from the simple of just this calla lily that's beautiful and yellow up against the blue background to focus stacking, something really technical and complex. 
some cameras you might actually have to use software to be able to do focus stacking or focus bracketing. A lot of cameras now have the ability to focus bracket, that is actually take a series of pictures. And then some cameras, such as the camera that Tom and I are using right now, the OM-1, has the ability to actually focus stack in camera as well. So you can see this blue Himalayan poppy. Everything on it is completely sharp. Every one of the little, you know, you know, fibers that are on there, the butt is sharp, but the background is still really pleasing. So what focus bracketing does is it actually will take a picture of something very close to the lens and it just keeps moving back and back and back. And then either in software or for us in our cameras, it'll actually stack that together and give us an image where the whole subject is sharp as if we took it at f22, but the background looks like we've taken at 2.8 as well. So it's really kind of fun to be able to do this. And I'll talk about this uh, more as we go throughout here as well. We're going to be talking about camera settings. We're going to be talking about, again, things that are technical and you might go, ah, but, you know, how long would it take us perhaps to learn how to do some of this in software? Yes, it's going to take some time to go learn how to do this in your camera, but it is worth it because you're going to be able to see right in your camera that you've achieved one of these types of things. So I'll talk about uh, different things. Again, simple things, inspirational things, complex things. So a little something for everybody in here. Also talk about some of the other computational technologies, such as live composite. Live composite is going to be basically the ability to do what we might need Photoshop or another program to do, where we can actually put hundreds of layers together and kind of have them stack in on light and blend mode. So what live composite is going to do is it's actually going to freeze our ambient light with our first exposure and then only add new light in. The pink Cadillac here, I went up to the headlights and I shined my flashlight into it. I light painted the car and I'll talk about light painting. And then the earth is turning and it is providing the new light. And I just kind of let that go. Um, and there is an article in Olympus Passion Magazine that kind of talks about um, the use of live composite. And it is, again, one of those really addictive kind of uh, computational technologies that's actually out there as well. Um, it's a lot of fun to be able to be out there and see being on the back of a camera when you're actually exposing with an Olympus camera. Now, we welcome all makes and models. We have people that come with film cameras, phones. Um, there actually is a phone app that does live composite. We had somebody at Sleepy Hollow Cemetery last year, um, and she was using her phone. So there's lots of computational technology that's out there. Um, and then for things that perhaps your camera either model or make can't do, all these things can be done via software as well. So I'm not going to talk about anything that can't be done with all kinds of cameras today. So if you think about what live composite is, if I have on the top picture here, the exposure open for 90 seconds, this is actually a night picture and I'm out at a lighthouse. And over that 90 seconds, the light from the lighthouse has exposed so much that it almost looks like it's a daytime scene. There's a lot of light pollution from the surrounding city and you can barely make out the stars that are in there just within a 90 seconds. And yet on the bottom here, we have a 16 minute exposure that is done right after that and they are 20 second exposures and they're actually stacked so the first 20 second freezes the ambient light and then every 20 seconds it refreshes and only new light comes in typically the only new light would be as the earth is turning and we're going to get stars but you're going to see that a barge actually went by and there's a line in the water um, during this as well so any new light that would be coming in would be introduced but the lighthouse itself does not continue to overexpose the light pollution from the city doesn't overexpose and we've actually done star trails in new york city we've done them out in philadelphia we've done them in san francisco even though there's light pollution you can actually still kind of freeze that ambient light so it's a a lot of fun. And that's what this all should be, right? Your photography should be fun. It should be something that when you trip the shutter, like you're smiling, that you're enjoying doing it. It's something that gets you perhaps to not think about other things that are going on in your life. It should be definitely something that you look forward to and it can be a kind of therapy in some sorts of ways as well. So for um, this presentation, like I said, there's going to be a wide variety of different things, some simple, some technical, um, different types of uh, computational technologies, and then some simple advice as well. But I hope for everybody, it's kind of an eye-opening experience and that everybody has a chance to be able to come away with something from this as well. 
Um, it's again, we're going to kind of take it into these two um, types of, of subject matter, kind of the simple type things and more like inspiration and picking a subject. And then the second part of it will be more the computational technology. I think time is really amazing when it comes to photography, right? The raw materials of photography are time and light. And I have a t-shirt that says, um, you know, I have superpowers. I can freeze time. Um, it's pretty neat that as photographers, we get to be able to, whether it's taking pictures of people, whether it's taking pictures of a peer like this, we're freezing that memory. Um, and that's a pretty um, awesome experience that we can do with our just time and light. So I'll talk about time at the beginning first, because that ability to freeze time and do longer exposures opens us up to things that maybe our eye can't see, such as star trips. Um, we know that the, you know, um, you know, we live in the solar system. We know what's going on as far as, um, you know, the rotation that's going on, but yet we can't see it with our naked eyes and our camera allows us to be able to do it. Um, if we go to the ocean, uh, like we did on this workshop here, um, the ocean is constantly moving, but a long exposure, we can actually smooth that out and get a very different kind of a feel because we can freeze time. And a lot of when we're going to different places, we will do this. Um, we'll do it either with a straight, just long exposure. We'll do it using live neutral density. We'll do it using live composition, or um, we'll actually put a physical um, ND filter on. Um, we tend to use breakthrough technology filters, but we've also liked some of the new Nissi filters as well. Um, they do work really well. Um, there are um, cheaper um, ND filters, but it's one of those things like you only cry once if you kind of buy the better neutral density filter. Um, variable filters tend to be the go-to for people when they're starting, but variables have um, I, different kinds of optical problems with them in them as well. So Nissi is um, great. Somebody had asked about the 7 to 14. So you can actually buy a little adapter um, and you can actually put that on your 7 to 14 to be able to put filters on that. Um, Tommy used to use it all the time. Um, since we've now bought the 8 to 25 millimeter, um, that one fits filters directly on it. We've actually taken that little contraption off of it because we're mainly using our 7 to 14 for Milky Way and night photography. We're really not using that um, for um, long exposures anymore, but you certainly could do that as well. Um, long exposures, again, can make the ocean go completely smooth. I was photographing shells. It was a really socked in day. did not look like we were going to have any sunset. And the last minute, right before sunset, all of a sudden, this crack came through the clouds and the ocean just lit up pink. I immediately just switched my camera off of focus stacking. I put live neutral density on. I did a minute exposure, smoothed out the water, had these wonderful old piers that were there and was able to kind of switch gears really easily and use the technology at my disposal. I hadn't brought a physical ND filter with us because it was a completely socked in day. There was really no chance that there was going to be a sunset. And then surprise, there it was. So having a live ND filter is something that can be very useful to be able to kind of keep that creativity going at all times. I love doing some of these long exposures where, again, the water just looks almost like it's frozen over. So this waterfall here, we kind of get the silky water, and then we can actually get the top of this reservoir here kind of almost looking like ice. Um, this one here, Tom uh, photographed, we were on our way to be able to photograph eagles and we're going over this area and there's water on both sides and there's fog and we see this old dilapidated pier and dock and we just said, we, we got to stop. And so we found a place to you know safely pull over. We walk back and just doing a long exposure just to be able to get that really weird feeling that you get by doing a long exposure over this water in the fog in this particular case. Sometimes you get to a scene and maybe it's not that inspirational to you, um, but if you do a longer exposure with it, all of a sudden it can really change the feel. So these lobster traps had potential to us where I was working it and trying to see what I could do. I did some zoom bursts, some intentional camera movement and having just a little bit of fun. And then I said, well, what if I actually put it on live composite? Now as the waves are coming in, that's that new light that's actually taking over. And I love the effect of this as if they are kind of sitting there on this foggy area. I love it much more than I do the original picture that was just taken at, say, one two hundredth of a second versus having that light stacking up and getting that kind of smoothness to the water that's going on here as well. 
Um, being able to do any kind of waterfalls with live is pretty cool as well. Um, there was a question that I saw pop up about the water droplets. Um, if you go to the OM system and look up us, uh, Tom and Lisa, you will actually see an article um, that's in their learning content under a name that gives you step-by-step -step for how to be able to do it. But basically, it's a piece of glass with rain -X on it. And the rain -X is what you normally would put on your windshield so that the rain kind of dispels and beads up. And you're actually putting that on a piece of glass and that makes the water droplets actually bead up. And there's a pretty good step-by-step -step that's actually up on the site for that particular one. Um, we love to be able to have fun with our photography. Um, we just did a hijinks uh, uh, this past weekend where we had all different types of subject matter that was available, uh, you know, smoke and water droplets and just all different types of things. And we just love to be able to have fun with our photography as well. Um, so there was a question also about um, long exposures, and I will talk about um, when we do use a tripod and when we, we don't with regard to long exposures. Um, I can handhold with um, the image stabilization of almost all the mirrorless cameras nowadays, uh, pretty long exposures, but not when we're starting to talk about minutes and a lot of these we're, we're looking at a much longer period of time. Um, this one here is up at Niagara Falls. We're at the, the horseshoe. And when I looked over, it just looked like a scene out of like, you know, the movie from King Kong or something. So I knew that I wanted to be able to put it into black and white. So on my camera, I actually converted. Um, there's a place where you can actually switch over to monochrome. Now, the raw file is still going to be a color file, but I wanted to be able to experience it and see it in black and white. Remember the uh, LCD is actually showing you a JPEG. So if you actually switch your uh, camera over to monochrome, you'll be able to kind of compose and see in monochrome. I'm still going to process that color image and be able to um, convert it to black and white using my preferred software. But I love being able to kind of see the feeling of it right out of the, the camera as well. Long exposures can be great in the fall as well. We have all these wonderful colors that are going on here. And as I mentioned, the new image stabilization is just phenomenal. Um, with my DSLR, I really was at one five hundredth of a second. I knew that for me, I'm a little bit hyper, that if I'm going to want a sharp picture, I needed to be able to have that. So I used the tripod most of the time when I had my DSLR to the point where if I couldn't take my tripod, like I didn't know if I wanted to go because even though I hated the tripod, I loved the pictures I got with the tripod. Now, all of a sudden we have this amazing image stabilization in our mirrorless cameras. Um, my particular uh, camera um, also syncs with the 12 to 100 millimeters. So I get even more image stabilization and I can routinely hand hold a half a second, one second, um, at one second, I'm probably getting maybe five out of six images sharp, um, but I'm willing to uh, to do with that, to not have to always have a tripod with me. Oftentimes, I am bringing a tripod for long exposures, and then I'm actually carrying a second body, and I'm walking around doing fun things like this while my first body might be open for 10 minutes. So rather than stand there for 10 minutes, I prefer to be able to kind of multitask and actually have a second body that's available. Oops, wrong direction. Um, the ability to do a longer exposure also gives you the ability to do some light painting. So here we have some mushrooms that are kind of long in the tooth, so to speak. Um, we have a local um, uh, farmer's market and they sometimes will give us some uh, produce that is long in the tooth because they know we're a little bit wonky ourselves and love to be able to photograph things like this. So it's kind of interesting as a mushroom, just be able to kind of look at it in regular light. But when you light paint it, it just takes on a completely different feel to it. And Tom and I do lots of light painting. We do workshops um, both in our studio and all different types of places. Um, we've got one in the fall coming up at Old Car City. We're going to be light painting at night. We go to New Hampshire, um, pretty much all over the East Coast. And then occasionally we'll also venture out to the West Coast and off of our wonderful little continent here. But light painting is basically intentionally taking a flashlight and kind of thinking of where you want the shadows and the highlights to it and adding some dimensionality to it. It's very different than the flat lighting. It's very different than all the fun things we can do with light drawing and like, like pointing and all the wonderful orbs and spheres that we can do. There's a plethora of different types of tools that we can actually have to be able to paint with light. But in this particular case, it's kind of a very intentional painting that we're actually doing. And you can paint anything. 
So you can paint things that are in, a, you know, in your refrigerator. You can paint the carrots before you make the chicken noodle soup. Um, it's a lot of fun to be able to kind of, again, have these things kind of take on a different dimensionality to it as well. Um, our light painting tools are pretty um, easy. Um, you're looking at a paper towel roll that's caught at a 45 degree angle, and that's going to basically allow the light to be able to go toward your subject more. Or you can go to any hardware store and you can actually purchase a little uh, elbow, spray paint it black, and you can kind of gaffers tape it to your flashlight. They make little pen lights. They make little flexible lights. Occasionally, we'll also use an LED light, um, but it's really fun to be able to do these. You can just use a $10 um, trifold from like Staples, um, and so you don't need any kind of elaborate setup to be able to start doing some light painting in there. So here is a dead plant that had been sitting around my house for many years. And finally, I said, you know, I think it's uh, time to be able to photograph it. So I, you know, brought it downstairs and again, light painting it, kind of thinking of where you want the light to be able to go and go over that. Um, and doing live composite, you see it happening. So I equate it to kind of, you're watching your brownies bake in the oven. You have a glass door on your oven and maybe you like your brownies brownies chewy or maybe you like your brownies crunchy like when you like it you can stop it and you can see that effect so it makes you much more productive because you don't have to kind of go through some of that trial and error you can have a lot of fun doing light painting you can light paint things outside as well this is our uh, workshop that we do in September in Maine. And so we're out here um, at low tide and I saw this little crab. Uh, everybody was painting this little um, this little uh, dinghy boat that was over kind of to the side. And I saw this little crab and I thought, I gotta light paint the crab, right? So anything you could light paint. Um, mushrooms are awesome to be able to light paint. It's so much fun to be able to uh, be out there even in the middle of the day and to light paint those. So Tom found this cute little uh, mushroom and took just a regular picture of it. And then when he light painted it again it makes kind of the background kind of disappear um it makes that mushroom you know like effervescent almost so it's kind of fun to be able to do this as well um, you can also do this um, with Olympus cameras because of live composite, even in the middle of the day. So I'm at a National Wildlife Refuge here. Tom was leading a workshop um, this particular day for PPA. And so I'm just playing around, looking around at things. And then all of a sudden I see all these little like toadstools. Now you're going to laugh as to where these are. They're right outside the porta potties. So I'm now lying on the ground next to the porta potties and I'm actually light painting these. So they're kind of cool, but the sun's kind of modeled and they're not real that interesting except when I light painted it right this was so neat to be able to get down and actually do this so um it was kind of fun to be able to transform something that was had the potential but because of the model light it was hard to be able to photograph it as I actually saw it in this particular case here I'm actually using a platypod so a platypod actually got me completely down on the ground um, and platypods can be a lot of uh, fun to be able to really get you to a uh, so soil level without and with the or Articulating LCD, um, sometimes you can actually just put it down and focus and you don't even have to, to lie on the ground. Um, Tom light painted this. So you can light paint things that are small, light paint things that are big, light paint things that are inside, that are outside. As I mentioned, we're actually doing a, uh, a photo workshop for Old Car City. In November, we'll be doing all the daytime stuff, but then we have special permission to be able to stay there at night and do some light painting with it as well. Um, this was what Tom got me for my birthday. I used to work with bioluminescent fish. And so when we saw this garden ornament, I'm like, oh, we have to have this. And so he light painted uh, this as well. So it's a lot of fun of things you can do. So there was a question about um, the tripod. Um, so we do use a Peak Design tripod. Um, I use a tripod less and less and less because of the amazing image stabilization. But when I'm doing these long exposures, when you're doing night photography, um, this tripod is the first tripod that we've ever loved. It is a tripod that's really small and compact and it is really sturdy. We've done hour-long um, star trails with it. It kind of finally, they have made the, you know, the uh, Goldilocks, you know, this bed is too hard and this bed is too soft. And we have so many different tripods, always searching for the perfect tripod and finally have that one. So there was a question related to our, our tripods. So we use a tripod less and less. Most of our bird photography is handheld. Most of our flower photography, most of our focus stacking at normal magnifications is handheld. Once you start getting to 2X and, you know, 4X, you do need a tripod um, for, for those. But a lot of our photography is handheld. Hand 
you need to also know something about what you're photographing. So, um, you know, if there's a local astronomy group, sometimes they have in the summer, like one or two just public nights, go to it. Um, if you happen to be able to get to a planetarium, go to it, like learn a little something. Um, same when I talk about birds, like if there's a bird club near you, like, you know, join the bird club. So a lot of people ask how to be able to photograph the stars so they actually look like this circle. And I had somebody that actually did a one-on-one -on -one with me. And she said, I, I think there's something wrong with my camera. I can't get star trails. And she told me what she was doing. So she was doing about a 20 second exposure using live composite stacking. And I couldn't understand when she said she wasn't getting star trails. Well, she wasn't facing toward the North Star. So she was getting lines rather than circles. So she had all of the technology of the camera well handled, but she did not know something about where to find that North Star. So if there's any constellation you're going to be able to learn, learning where the Big Dipper is is important because if you can find the Big Dipper and it moves around at different times of the year, as far as up, down, where the handle goes, if you can find that, you can find the North Star and then you know where to be able to position your camera so that you can get those concentric stars. Now, this one here is a very interesting one because if you notice, there's actually fireflies that have also done some live composite in the foreground. So we uh, do a workshop up in Vermont and they still have fireflies up there, unlike Connecticut, where we have pesticide almost all of them out of the state. So we have that ability to have some really cool things with fireflies that are going on there at the same time. So finding that Big Dipper, and in this particular case, I, I put a little filter on the stars just for teaching purposes, finding that Big Dipper, and then being able to know that Big Dipper is going to be able to lead to the North Star, and that allows you to be able to position your camera. Now, there's cool apps that can do that now, too. Um, if you're using photo pills, and there's a variety of other apps that you can use as well, um, there's things that you can do to help you to be able to find that as well. But you want to be able to locate that North Star if you want concentric. Now, we both do all kinds of star trails. We'll face all the different Southeast, North, and West. Um, but we do like sometimes for certain subject matter to be able to have the stars actually end up being circular with that North Star in the middle there. So when we go, I'm generally taking two uh, cameras with me, plethora of different uh, light painting tools. I'll leave one of the cameras on for you know an hour and then I'll just kind of wander around and do some maybe just simple light painting with my other one eventually coming back to the first one so we have a lot of fun when we uh, do this uh, we'll be leading a workshop out at Death Valley coming up as well so lots of uh, possibilities for doing uh, night photography out there so again if you happen to be able to find a cool subject matter that you can light paint and put underneath your North Star then you can kind of you know get a wonderful foreground as well as having your star trails be up above. It's often really cool to be able to knock on somebody's door and ask if you can light paint their car or their truck. And sometimes you're met with like, you want to light what? And they don't understand. Other times, you know, they're kind of uh, have some idea because they've seen some of this type of, of genre as well. Um, but do always ask permission to be able to uh, be on somebody's property, especially at night. So just like we can use that light and blend mode to be able to do star trails, um, we can also cloud stack. So this is a very similar uh, type of photography. And again, if your camera can't do live composite, you can do those star trails in Photoshop or in you know, star stack or other types of software. Um, the same would go if your um, camera doesn't do live composite you can still be able to do some cloud stacking that's going on there as well. So the cloud stacking is gonna do the same thing. Our foreground isn't moving, but in this particular case, the clouds are actually moving as well. Um, so there was a question related to what lenses uh, we love. So um, if I'm just doing star trails, the 12 to 100, the 12 to 40, the 12 to 45, the 8 to 25, any of those are great for just doing star trails. If I want to start doing specifically Milky Way, that's where I really want a 2.8 lens rather than an f4 lens. That's where the 12 millimeter 2.0 is a wonderful lens. Um, the 17 millimeter is nice. The 8 millimeter is nice. The 7 to 14 is nice. You want a 2.8 or wider um, if you're actually going to be doing Milky Way. But if you're doing star trails, um, most of the of the lenses will be able to do a really good job with that. 
Um, in this particular case, um, it was toward the evening. So um, this is a half a second exposure. And I have my aperture at F22 and my ISO down to low so that I can have a very, um, you know, dark base that's going on because I know the clouds are streaking past. And then every half second, it just keeps updating. Other times if I'm doing this in the middle of the day, Tom and I then would use our breakthrough or our NISI neutral density and would actually put that on there as well. Um, it's kind of fun because you don't know exactly what you're going to get when you do cloud stacking, but often you'll get these um, pinks and fuchsias and it almost looks like somebody took a paintbrush to your imagery as well. Um, Tom had fun getting kind of down low and this, this is just a puddle on top of the rock if you've been to Neville Lighthouse. Um, we uh, love being able to go there and do uh, workshops and we stop any chance that we have um, to be able to go there. This is down in Pennsylvania. And again, we have this wonderful, huge, you know, steel furnace that's going on here. So we have something that really anchors it. And then the clouds doing their stacking. So you just kind of leave it open. And then again, you're watching it cook. And if you like your brownies, you know, you know, chewy, if you like your brownies crunchy, like you get to stop it exactly when it's done for your artistic taste. Uh, this one here is out in Palouse, and we've done workshops out there as well. And Palouse is just wonderful hills and hills and hills. So much fun as well. There is a question about what star would you focus on in the Southern Hemisphere? Maybe somebody in the chat can answer that one. I guess I'm going to have to look that one up. I'm a Northern Hemisphere gal. So um, you've stumped me on that one. Um, I should know the answer to it, but I don't know my astronomy that well. So um, maybe somebody else can, or if not, um, Kitty, maybe we could uh, look that up and get back to you on that one. Um, this one here is out in Death Valley, and we happen to be out there one of these days that it rained, right? It very rarely rains in Death Valley. So we have a puddle that Tom found, and the puddle is almost like mimicking what's going on in the sky. So he did this long exposure, getting these clouds stacking going on, and then again, the mountains kind of just anchoring it to be able to allow this. I find sometimes if everything is moving, it can be... Um, not a settling of an image. I like something in our cloud stacking that's actually going to be stationary as well. Um, we uh, This particular morning, we were doing a workshop at Chincoteague, and the uh, clouds were supposed to be 100% cloud cover. And we've got everybody up at 5 a.m. We're there when the gates open up. Everybody, including us, we're not sure we're going to have any sunrise. And then, wow, we were just, you know, blanketed with this wonderful color. We did long exposures. We did cloud stacking. We did regular exposures. We had so much fun being able to play with this. But again, the cloud stacking, because of the way it's building up the light, you do tend to get um, a lot of these fuchsias in here as well. And it just looked like a painter just took brushes. And it's straight out of camera um, for people who can do live composite. If not, you can do the same thing using the light and blend mode in uh, Photoshop as well. Out in Maine at a lighthouse. And this particular day, we kind of had a kind of an overcast kind of day. The clouds weren't really um, becoming... So I put a 10 stop neutral density on and I just let it go for about 10 minutes and got these wonderful purple colors going on here. Um, it was just really neat. And in just a few seconds of not having a neutral density on, like this was the day we had, right? So by being able to control light and control time and be able to build up that light over a 10 minute exposure, we were able to kind of make lemonade out of a sky that wasn't that interesting that particular day. So I much prefer this one here. Um, and we love to be able to just kind of be done and see that finished product and um, not have to, uh, you know, do anything uh, to it. And you see that creativity happening as you're actually tripping the shutter. So again, some of the things we're going to be talking about are more computational. So things like live time and live composite. And then I have scattered in here lots of things that also don't require those, those technologies as well. So like I said, something for, for everybody within here. So we're going to go back to some of the simpler things first, and then we'll switch back to the computational um, as well. Um, somebody did mention about focusing. So that question really depends on what kind of camera that you have. Um, if you happen to have an EM1 Mark III or an OM1, you have Starry Night Autofocus. Basically, in that particular instance, you're pressing the starry a night. Um, it looks for the stars. You basically are putting a focus box up in the sky rather than down in the foreground. And it actually will look for the stars. Otherwise, the best approach is actually to go out during the day 
focus on something that is really far, maybe a mountain and kind of put maybe a either a little, um, you know, note like a little, a little, um, you know, posting note or uh, put a rubber band and kind of keep the lens kind of in that particular position. The third way would be to try to use the magnifier and try to be able to magnify in like 10x and to be able to manually focus using focus peaking on a star. It can be hard to be able to focus at, at night and the starry night um, autofocus is a game changer for sure. So we're going to talk about focus stacking later, but what if you don't have the ability to focus stack or have never focus stacked or for years when focus stacking was very difficult and we needed kind of focusing rails and cognizant systems and all kinds of elaborate things to be able to focus stack. In that genre is going to be important to be able to think where you're placing your camera sensor compared to your subject. You want to basically think about two planes, like two pieces of bread, and you want them to always be parallel. Think about your sandwich stuff would all fall out if it's not parallel anymore. So you want it to be parallel. So in this particular case, my camera and my butterfly are parallel. That's going to allow me to be able to get the best depth of field. My background in this case is far enough away that it's not distracting. So backgrounds become really important of the placement of your subject and making sure you have three or four feet before you get to kind of run into anything that could actually interfere. So you've really got to be able to think about keeping that camera sensor parallel parallel to your subject. That'll give you the greatest depth of field. And you can practice this on your kitchen table. Get your cereal box out or in a box of pasta, any type of box, and put that box parallel and then put it at an angle and you'll see your depth of field falls off really quickly. So think about having that box always kind of being parallel um, to it, especially when you start doing macro photography. So things that are one-to-one -one life size, having that uh, focal plane be parallel is extremely important in that particular genre of photography here. So here you can see uh, the, the plane of the sunflower and the plane of the camera. You kind of want to think about that being kind of, like I said, two slices of bread and you don't want what's inside to be able to fall off. If you start kind of going off plane, all the insides of your um, sandwich are going to kind of fall out of your sandwich there. So practice that. That's something that you can do when it's too cold, when it's too hot, when you're too tired and, you know, something's going on in your life. Um, play around with things. Play around with your salt and pepper shake or um, get a bunch of Hershey's Kishes and line them up. Like, you know, do fun things and kind of play around. If you get a new lens, like play around with it. Um, don't just wait to be able to take a big trip as well. If you can get your camera, you know, really parallel to your subject matter, it's going to really enhance your depth of field immensely. As I said, especially um, it's not as important when you're doing um, bigger subjects or even close up. But once you start doing macro photography, it becomes really important to have that camera sensor be parallel. Um, you want your background again to be far enough away. Um, Tom found this salvia and found another color of it that was again three or four feet away so he could have this wonderful bokeh of that in the background um, and not have to worry about it competing and interfering. We're not always that lucky and that's where focus stacking can come into place very easily. But oftentimes again, just like I mentioned, looking for characters and looking for flowers, I'm looking at the background often first and then like, oh, is there something interesting I can actually Actually place in that background there. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes there's just not a possibility of eliminating the background clutter. And in that case, you can just go in really tight, make your subject part of your background. So in this case, the blue Himalayan poppy, the flower itself has become the background in that particular case to be able to make it not distracting. Um, this one here is a, is a peony. And again, that same type of idea that we can make the flower itself the background so that we don't have any distractions that are going on there. Another thing that we often think have to think about is our own mindset. So we get up, I am not a morning person. If I get up early in the morning and I'm going to photograph a sunrise and the sun, you know, uh, it doesn't give us a beautiful sunrise that day. I'm like, what do you do? Um, you're going to look around for other subject matter. I, I have, again, that macro lens that's always on me. I can use it for close-ups. I can find cool things. But you've got to kind of be receptive to those. So this particular day, we're out in Palouse. We're photographing all the wonderful hills. We're photographing the harvests that are going on. We're just having a blast doing kind of, you know, wheat and hills and landscape. And all of a sudden, this praying mantis comes, lands on my camera. I'm the frog whisperer, but I have a feeling that other critters seem to know that I love them. So it comes and lands on me. So I am using the 12 to 100 to do wide angle photography. I'm doing landscape photography. I'm doing all this fun stuff, but I got to take advantage of this. 
so I happen to have my 60 millimeter macro lens. I always have a close up lens on me as my second uh, camera. And I said, Tom, come over here. I said, pick up a piece of wheat and like coax them onto the piece of wheat. So the little guy goes on the piece of wheat. So now I've got this beautiful background far away. So not distracting at all. This little guy's just posing for me. Like he wanted me to photograph him. So I said, Tom, it's a beautiful blue sky day. Like hold it up higher into the sky. So the little guy again is just completely completely just smitten. he wants to be like on instagram so he finally goes if i look like count dracula maybe you'll put me on instagram so i had to be receptive to the fact that i'm doing wide angle and yet you know i'm always kind of thinking about other things that i can photograph there's always critters that are around um i like to joke that if we got to a national park and it was closed for some reason let's take it to death valley there's a flood it's closed like we could go to the local dump and we're gonna have just as much fun on that trip as we would going to the national park we're going to find things to be able to photograph. This particular day, it was supposed to be a, a beautiful fall day. We were supposed to be photographing fall foliage. We went for a walk in the woods, so the light rain really wasn't interfering with our group. And all of a sudden, I see this log, and I'm like, oh, my God, it looks like an alligator. It looks like an eye. So I asked one of our workshop participants, can I take a picture of your eye? And in camera, I did a multiple exposure and now had a little bit of fun with that as well. So multiple exposures can be a way of, again, like your expectations are this, but hey, wait a minute, we've encountered this. We're going to just run with it. And multiple exposure in camera is a lot of fun. And what was nice about this is that with my camera, I can actually see like a little ghost, a little overlay of the eye. So I could line it up perfectly. Um, I, you know, I took three pictures and, you know, they were all, all aligned within there. It wasn't that trial and error that you might have to do if you can't see that overlay that's going on in there. Um, we planted a lot of plants in our yard. Tom has probably dug, uh, I don't know, about a thousand holes in the past two years. Um, so we have pussy willows that are growing out there. Um, you walk around, you're looking for things to be able to photograph. Oh, the spring, they're just so wonderful. Um, and then how about a little gray tree frog? So those are native to, to Connecticut. Um, you know, the things that you can find sometimes, you got to kind of be open to it as well. If you find a feather, have fun with that feather, play around with it. Um, right before this call, actually, Actually, um, there was a stink bug in my bathroom and I'm like, Tom, <laughs> grab the yogurt container you just washed, put the stink bug in the refrigerator. I don't usually put insects in the refrigerator. Stink bugs I make an exception for because um, <laughs> they're stinky and they're invasive. They're not my favorite bug, but they photograph macros so cool. So he's actually waiting because uh, we couldn't photograph him right away. So we're going to photograph him after uh, this uh, here. So on the left, you see a 90 millimeter um, on our system. That's 180 millimeter. This is a 40th of a second. So at this particular instance, we are on a tripod and that's because we're going to do super macro. So we could have upped our ISO and just, you know, handhold it. Um, we could have just done 140F just straight, but we want to be able to go into 2X magnification, which is the next uh, picture in the middle one. So now I'm at an eighth of a second. Second. Um, actually, Tom took these. And then you can see he's at a half of a second of going in, you know, really, really close on these feathers. So it is kind of fun to be able to kind of get the big picture first and then going closer and going closer. And pretty much anything makes good subject matter. Like you can take a toothbrush and once you start magnifying it at, you know, 2x, 2.8x, 4x, it's really cool. Um, the 90 millimeter is kind of unique in that it is really the only lens out there at that magnification that does autofocus. Um, like uh, Canon has a great, um, the MP, which is one to five X, but it's manual focus. I had tried that and I was frustrated and had to send it back before my 30 days was up because I didn't have the patience for a manual focus macro lens. I'm thinking about, again, your backgrounds first. So oftentimes we pick our background first, and this was true whether we, um, when we took our workshop to Cuba, I found a really cool background. Then we waited for an interesting person to pass by that background. We do it for our birds. We do it for our flowers. We do it for our butterflies. Find an interesting background. And then you're then good, find a good subject to be able to put into that background as well. And again, notice then the camera is as parallel as I can get to uh, the butterfly. So I'm always trying to be able to do it. Butterfly's head is turned a little bit. So you can see the antenna aren't quite uh, sharp in this particular case. Going in closer. So now I'm at 2x magnification. You can start to see all the little hairs on the butterfly. You see the proboscis. Um, it's really fun to be able to get in closer. All of you have probably seen a swallowtail butterfly, but did you know it had a forked proboscis? So once you're getting close, you start to again see the unseen things that you just wouldn't normally see before. 
we are photographing this Madagascar moon moth and we're just having a little fun with it. It's got these wonderful eye spots. We're seeing like a little face at the back of the butterfly. And all of a sudden it started to shake. Tom looked around the back and he's like, she's laying eggs. So flipping into that macro mode. Now we're in 2X macro magnification autofocus. I see three eggs. And I see four eggs and it was just like, oh, how cool is this? You know, so it's just, again, this idea of seeing the unseen. Now for the butterflies, we were using a flash, the FL700, uh, and we were using the AK diffuser to be able to diffuse the light really nicely. Most of the time we use natural light. Occasionally we will use off-camera flash. Occasionally we'll use an LED light. Um, but for, um, you know, butterflies and, and insects, um, this system here with the diffused light is definitely our uh, preferred lighting method that we're going to use. So thinking about, again, starting off with the big picture, we got these wonderful water droplets on the magnolia, and then going in close, close, close to get those water droplets. And just to give you a perspective, there's the little box around those water droplets. So big picture, 90 millimeter in close 2x magnification on those water droplets. Magnolias make great subject matters this time of year in the Northeast. So we have a lot of them blooming right now. Um, and you can, again, go do the big whole picture and then get in really close on these. Then get in a little bit closer on them. And then get in a little bit closer on them. Get in a little bit closer on them. And a little bit closer on them yet. Um, we can um, get to about three inches with either a 60 millimeter or a 90 millimeter. I won't get into uh, the technical parts of this because it's not a macro talk, but really close to our subject matter um, to be able to do um, life size 1X or greater than, than uh, life size 2X for a 90 millimeter lens. So we love to be able to do the big picture. So here's a wabi-sabi tulip and then just one petal. So just getting in on the pollen on that as well. Again, the big picture on things, and then just one of those with all the pollen on there. So I love to kind of tell the story first and then get the details. In our yard, we plant things to be able to attract critters to come. And then we also uh, plant flowers of kind of with the colors that we would want to be the background far enough away so that we can have the backgrounds that we want it to be as well. So in our yard, we have a variety of different host plants. And I'm sure if a true horticulturist, you know, kind of came to our yard and be like, well, why is that way over there? Well, because we wanted that as the background for, for something else. Um, planting milkweeds so that we could attract monarchs. And again, getting in really close on those as well. Just, you know, so much fun. Then you start to be able to see, um, you know, eggs and chrysalis and caterpillars going on. So just a lot of fun to be able to find uh, these different uh, things that you'd have. We, we plant as many things as possible in our yard. We have a uh, pesticide free. It's a national wildlife certified yard. So we can have as many things in there as possible. I mentioned looking for characters. Again, you're finding all of these flowers that are blossoming in the Northeast at this time of year. How do you pick which one you're going to photograph? I look and I look and I look and I'm trying to find again the one that's a little bit wonky. This one here, I love the way the petal was just kind of cupping down on the bottom. So had a little bit of fun with that. This one here again, inviting us in. So kind of just saying, come, come photograph me. This one here is a conjoined twin always looking for conjoined twins and nowadays in the supermarket if you look through like 12 pots of tulips you will find conjoined twins in one of them i love this one with the gentle embrace and even like the almost the hand that's coming up there so i see people i see you know just this oh you know i i see personifications going on that's what i'm looking for the magnolias, I see gnomes. So it's so much fun when you can find gnomes in your magnolias. And there's all different varieties of gnomes that are out there. So depending on the stage that you actually find them in, um, again, I'm personifying these and having a little bit of fun with them. I see dancers in the tulips. So I see these wonderful, delicate da dancers that are going on. So these are photographed against a light box. So an LED light box. In this case, you want blinkies. So blinkies are generally bad. We're taught from the beginning of digital photography that blinkies are bad. But when you're doing high key photography, you want the blinkies. You want those whites to be screaming. You want your subject to be properly exposed, or in this case, a little overexposed that makes it kind of translucent and having a little fun with it. This one just looks like this 
delicate ballerina that's going on in here. So I actually brought this one into Photoshop and I mirrored it. And you can now hear the music as the ballerinas come together in this dance. The music changes and they go to another position in that dance as well. So it's a lot of fun. And I think that's what's true about photography in general, but especially close-up photography and then macro photography is it's kind of magical. You get to see details and things that you just wouldn't even have an excuse to be able to notice otherwise. You get to fill the frame with those details. It allows you to slow down and pay attention to all the things that are going on. And you get almost this whole other world. You can walk out like and look in one bush and you're going to find tons of subject matter. So you don't have to go very far to be able to find subject matter. Pretty much anything could be your subject matter. Here's, you know, one leg of a cricket that's going on here. But it could be anything. It could be a fork that's in your drawer and play around with it. Get your, um, you know, if you have an LED light or use the torch that's on your, your smartphone and look at the shadow and look at the way you can actually make different things. Tell yourself you're going to take 12 pictures of your fork and see if you can come up with 12 different lightings on your fork. Tom moved the picnic table and underneath the picnic table is this fungus growing and it just was wonderful abstract form that's going on. We love looking for abstracts, say in the ice, when the ice is frozen, that juncture of seasons when you're going to get like ice storms or if you're near water and now your plant life in the wabi-sabi mode is going to be filled with frost. And here we have some rind frost on the edges. We have an old rind frost going on here on this old cone flower in this particular one. Again, I'll talk about focus stacking. Um, it's wonderful at the junction of those seasons where you can start to be able to see some of this. This is our bird feeder. Tom noticed when he went to put out the bird food that there was rind frost on the actual knob holding the bird feeder to the pole. We're out at a gold mine out in the elevations of California. And I looked down at the silverware that was left behind. And there's rind frost on the silverware. So it gave us, again, a chance to be able to slow down. We're at a stream. And I did a longer exposure, letting the water run. And I love the way the water has just etched away little people in the ice. So I brought this one back home. I flipped it upside down and I put some little eyes in here. So you can see on the um, upper uh, side here. The, but this little owl was just having so much fun up here this particular day. He did all kinds of little positions, all kinds of little expressions. I couldn't help but put him together and do a multiplicity of him. So when we do something that's photoshopped, it's very evident that it is photoshopped, like the aliens in the ice, like the multiplicity that's going on here. Um, here we have a wonderful little caterpillar, and I brought this in, and I did the little planet. So it's an app on a phone, or you can actually do this in Photoshop. So when we do something that's Photoshop, and I teach Photoshop. We love Photoshop. Um, you know, 300 layers. If you want to have fun and be creative, absolutely. But most of our images are pretty much, uh, you know, straight out of out of camera, or like I said, with a little raw adjustment that's going on here. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So um, here we were talking about when is Photoshop using these images. Um, most of our bird and nature photography, um, the images are pretty much straight out of camera. Maybe we brought them into RAW and done some contrast and adjustments, just um, some basic set the black point, set the white point. But in this particular case, the owl was having so much fun with expressions. He was moving a little bit. He's doing different expressions. I couldn't help but put it in Photoshop and do a multiplicity of him in Photoshop. So when we do something in Photoshop, it's very evident that it's been Photoshop. Um, we have fun. I teach Photoshop. Um, you know, any number of layers is completely game to me, but most of our images have minimal editing. Um, you can see this one here straight out of camera. This is a focus stack caterpillar, but then I had fun and I actually did a little planet on him. So when we do things in Photoshop, it's quite evident that we've had fun with this. Um, this one here, this little bud, and then having fun with a step and repeat going on with that as well. So um, again, if you go to our website or if you look back, this was our um, 21 favorite flowers of 2021. These are all, you know, straight out of camera. Um, there's not uh, Photoshop being done on those. Um, here's our favorite 21 nature pictures. And we've got some computational technologies going on in them. We've got a multiple exposure in camera, but no Photoshop in there. And here's 21 favorite non 
one nature pictures and there's one of these images it's the one with the uh, person wearing the the suit and pouring the uh, molten steel that one has been composited so you can see out of these three sets of 21 that you know we really have one image um, in here um, when we do compositing like we identify it as as compositing but for the most part like I don't have time to be sitting at the computer I'd much rather just be like cooked right out of camera and that's why I love like live composite and focus stacking and things like that. This one here is a multiple exposure in camera. So I saw the moon just a little bit further down from where the heron was sitting. So I took the picture of the moon, have this overlay. And so that one there is a creative in-camera multiple. The same with this one here with Tom trying to play basketball with the moon. So this is an in-camera multiple exposure. But this one here is straight out of camera. This particular day we used photo pills and we aligned ourselves to be able to know where the moon was coming up. We were actually off by a few yards. Um, we had to kind of run down as it started to be able to pop up on the horizon, but we were very close um, and we were able to do this uh, straight out of camera. Same with this one here, um, straight out of, out of camera um, to be able to, to do that as well. We love working as subjects, so we generally kind of saying, you know, do the big picture first and then kind of go in for some details and then go in for some more details, and then go in for some more details. So here we've got some fungus that's actually growing and using the carbon molecules in the rubber of the window. And these are really fun to be able to do macro on. There's all kinds of shape. There's all kinds of characters that are going on here. Here I've got the setting sun behind, you know, so it's leaving a shadow that's going on. This one here, it looks like animals howling like at the sun. Um, these are just growing up out of the carbon molecules that are in the rubber in the old windows of these cars. Um, you get all these cool little slime molds. And this is an old car. You can see here, it's actually got something where we don't see in our cars anymore, where you could actually, in the old days, use a coat hanger if you locked yourself out of the car. And you can see these little guys growing right along the, the rubber. This one here, to me, looks like Shrek. So it can be uh, fun to be able to, again, personify these. And you start seeing faces and you start seeing characters in this. And the idea of seeing uh, faces in inanimate objects is called pareidolia. Um, we were at a, doing a workshop in Maine and I looked down on the beach and I'm like, it's a pink hat lady. So you never know what you're going to come across as you're walking along. I was on my way to the pink Cadillac that I showed earlier and I'm like, oh, I see WC Fields in the doorknob. So um, Wabi Sabi is uh, something that you tend to get hooked on and Paradoia is another one that you definitely tend to be able to get hooked on. This one here is on our uh, sore horse in the backyard. This one here is on an old rusty car, and it looks like a little dog. How about this ant on another car? So as the metal starts to deteriorate, you can see these types of shapes. This one here looks like it's just smiling, happy as can be. This one here is on my praying mantis. This is actually the top of the praying mantis. So you can actually see the head of the praying mantis. You can see the legs, and all I did was... Um, blackened out the other part because I'm like, oh my God, I see two eyes, I see a nose, I see lips. How can that be on my praying mantis? Found this in the woods. Just serendipity. I love, once you start seeing pareidolia, you'll see faces everywhere. Right now in our Northeast, we're seeing bleeding hearts blooming. It's so much fun to be able to get out and do some focus stacking with them. But look for hearts in the trees. Look for hearts in the rocks. Look for hearts everywhere. Uh, my good friend Cindy pointed this one out to us. She wrote us a little map. And it's like, you've got to go down the road. Then you turn around to this mailbox and come back. And there's a heart in the tree. Um, this one here was my tripod made a heart in the sand. So I had put the tripod down. I had moved it. And when I went to pick up to leave, I looked down and there's this heart in the sand. Uh, Tom found these um, out at Acadia. So he found a heart and a rock that almost looked like the heart had come from it. And then another one where it looked like it was embedded in it. Um, some of the spring flowers have hearts in them as well. Down in Death Valley on an old riverbed is a broken heart. This one here was on our workshop in New Hampshire. Um, and this one here is in a lupin flower. About one third of the lupin flowers have hearts in them. And you can see on the left, the tiny little boxes of everybody doing some handheld macro photography and close-up photography with those. This one is in an orchid. And I turned this one upside down in Photoshop. You can see the heart at the top of the orchid. And so I just, when I, with my camera, my 90 millimeter, after doing the big picture, I started doing the little parts of it as well. And it's fun doing big pictures and then getting in closer. Who knew this is what a red-eyed green tree frog's eyelid looked like? It's got this lace pattern on it. It is so cool. 
eyeballs are so neat. Some frogs have eyeballs that are long. Some eyeballs are tall and more vertical looking. Has to do with, are they more nocturnal or are they more a predator versus a prey? All frogs are technically both. But you can see my Australian frog, the eye is more horizontal. Um, here is my Pac-Man frog and he's got more of a rounder eye. This eye here, eye here is really, really strange. It almost looks like he's got a solar system or a really cool marble going on. This is a boat-tailed gecko um, owned by my friend Fred. And you can see this little guy just having a little meal. And the eyeballs are so neat. So it's really cool to be able to get in really tight on them. The problem with macro photography is you don't have a sense of scale. So it's hard to be able to know how big or how small something is. So sometimes it's good to be able to, you know, have somebody photograph it against your thumb for perspective. Then you have an idea of how big or how small something is. Often that perspective is really important. So a lot of the images that you've seen, again, are focus stacked. And so the idea of focus stacking is if you take one picture at f2.8, the flower is not sharp. That's the image on the left. If we take one picture at f22, now the flower is completely sharp, but the background is distracting. Focus stacking allows you to be able to have the best of both worlds. Your background is 2.8, but your subject is f22. And I'm warning you, it's addictive. It's technical. Some people are like, oh, I don't know if I, if I like it. But I like the fact that I can do it right out of camera. I can be done. I don't have to be able to bring it home and to be able to post-process it. So focus stacking is basically combining pictures to get a larger depth of field that you could in one single picture. And again, having this beautiful bokeh background that's going on here. It's especially useful for macro photography because in macro photography, you could be at F22 or F36. And no matter what, you can't get enough depth of field in a macro image. Um, and you also will uh, at macro photography start to have some distortion at those apertures as well. So the question becomes like, when do you focus stack? If your background is not three feet away, if your background is complex and complicated and you want your background to really be sharp all the way through, um, if you have you know, a nice plain background behind your subject and it's three feet away, you probably don't need to be able to focus stack as I showed some earlier in the pictures where you can have a non-distracting background. But a lot of times we don't have those clean, crisp environments. And so therefore we need it. Or as I mentioned, if you're going to do any kind of magnification for macro photography, you need to be able to focus stack. So 2.8, we only have the grill of Bugs Bunny being sharp, eight stacks. And most of my focus stacking um, is a 60 millimeter handheld. Um, it's eight or 10 stacks. If I need to go to 15, I'm generally going to use a tripod um, with the 90 millimeter, um, probably, more 50-50 with the tripod and handheld now. It's just a little bit of a bigger lens and I'm having a little bit more fun doing some um, intentional camera movement with it as well. So the fiddleheads are out right now at this time of year. So again, 2.8, the whole fiddlehead isn't sharp. The background looks great. The F22, background's terrible now. So we get the best of both worlds within those. Um, sometimes it's important for storytelling. Tom found this one where the baby blue Himalayan poppy is talking to the parent. They both need to be able to be sharp for that story. So this one here, he's got 15 images um, stacked. He tends to be on a tripod when he focus stacks. Um, I tend to prefer um, hand holding if I can do, um, again, between eight and, and 10. If I start to go up to 15, now if I need more than 15, I can always focus bracket and then bring it into Photoshop or Helicon Focus. But I just love those dreamy backgrounds. I love my subject being sharp. The other problem is that F20 or F22, oftentimes your shutter speed is really low, your ISO is high, and any little wind is also going to make your image not quite as sharp. So you can see here, focused on just the middle, everything else is kind of blurry. I love this Wabi Sabi. We've got all the phases of the buds. If I focus on the front, now that part's sharp, everything else is not. I need to be able to focus stack that together to be able to have all of those buds and be able to tell the whole story with that image as well. Focus stacking, like I said, can be really addictive. Once you get used to those dreamy backgrounds that are going on, um, we spent uh, four days uh, down at Longwood Gardens and uh, Tom uh, had just a blast with uh, doing things with the 90 millimeter uh, macro lens and focus stacking. But you can do these with critters too. Um, sometimes they'll move and then you have to kind of do it again. It'll give you an error message or it'll give you five antenna. Um, but I would say nine times out of 10, um, your shutter speed is fast enough so that you can even do this with things that are alive as well. Um, this is an orchid praying mantis. And this little guy sat perfectly still for me while I focus stacked it. 
So focus stacking. Now we're starting to talk more about computational technologies. And that's basically where we have kind of a computer. And in this case, our camera is the computer. And it's basically taking multiple images and putting them together. Now, again, our smartphones do this all the time. They've been doing it with uh, kind of live photo, where it basically takes a whole burst and you get to kind of pick. Um, it does it with, um, you know, apps. It does it with uh, being able to do a variety of things now. But in our cameras, we're now having this ability to be able to do the same type of thing where we can actually do something like focus stacking, take a whole bunch of pictures and kind of take the best of both worlds or do a uh, live composite and then be able to just add new light into that image. So the computational technology is definitely going far. And in the new OM1, there's a lot of computational uh, technology that's going on. So we have high res, which I really won't have time to talk about today. Live neutral density, I've mentioned a couple of times, focus stacking. Um, HDR has been, again, even in our phones for a long period of time, and then multiple exposure. Then we have things like live composite. There was a question about um, how do you determine the distance um, for focus stacking? So there is a differential under focus stacking. The differential is one, meaning it wants you to move just a little bit at a time, and then the scale is one to 10. 10 would be moving a lot at a time. But it's not something set because it depends upon what lens you're using. It depends upon what aperture you're using. Um, because if I'm using a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, I don't want it to move a millimeter at a time. Then it's going to kind of go, you know, meters at a time because it knows I'm doing landscape. If I'm kind of at 2x magnification, it's going to move in smaller increments. So you do kind of have to play around and say, okay, for this kind of subject matter, like this would be how many I need to be able to take. Um, I find for me, um, my sweet spot again tends to be between that 10, 8, eight or 10 for doing handheld. Um, I think Tom's much more likely to do uh, 15 um, or if he needs to, to be able to focus bracket. Um, so you have to kind of determine like for your subject that you've picked, for the background that you've picked, for your aperture, for your lens, for um, how busy is the background. And you have to kind of play around and do a little trial and error with, uh, with some of those as well. So live composite. So again, knowing first where the Big Dipper is and being able to identify that is going to be really important. So I've just drawn little dots over the Big Dipper in this particular case. So now I'm going to be able to see where that Big Dipper is. The Big Dipper is going to be able to point to my North Star. So that is something that you've got to kind of learn if you want to do the concentric stars. Um, for live composite, you've got to figure out what's going to be your base exposure. So that you can do um, in any mode, really, is my base exposure. Half a second, one second, five seconds, 10 seconds. What, what's the kind of the base exposure if I was just going to take one picture? What would I need to kind of get a good ambient you know, light for, for my, my scene? Um, for night photography, often it can be 20 or 30 seconds. If you're in a really light polluted area, it might be a much shorter time. If you're doing cloud stacking, it's going to be more like a half a second. Um, but being, in, being able to identify kind of where the North Star is going to be important for that process there so that you can make sure that those trails can go around. And as I showed before, if you kind of doing just a regular exposure, even 90 seconds um, is going to completely blow out everything. So 90 seconds as compared to 16 minutes, that's where the live composite freezes our ambient light. Live time would just continue to be able to um, bring all of that up. So you could freeze the ambient light of the city and then have the car trails be your live composite. So there's lots of things that you can do um, with it as well as light painting itself. So um, have you used high res for macro? Yes. So um, high res mode, um, again, we probably won't have time to talk about that a lot, but basically that is sensor shifting. Tom loves high res mode um, and high res mode. He even does for birds. A lot of birds sit still long enough for him to be able to do. Um, he's done high res uh, HDR panoramas. Um, he, he does a lot more high res than I do. So instead of just your regular sensor size, it'll give you like a 50 or 80 megapixel file and the file isn't just bigger but each pixel is actually cleaner with less chromatic aberration as well so there's some good reasons to actually use um high res um i tried to be able to fit that in here and just kind of uh, knew it wasn't going to make the the final cut so bird photography, this is something you've got to practice, right? So how do you get these kinds of pictures? You've got to have pigeons or gulls near you. Everybody's got pigeons or gulls near you. You got to practice. You got to get out there and practice as well. So I hear people say, well, like, I'm not great at bird photography. I'm never going to be great at bird photography. And I love this quote. 
Whether or not you can be great at something, you can always become better at it. So never say, I'll never be good. Just say, I can get better. And one day you'll wake up and realize that you really are good. So it's one of these things that uh, Tom just photographed this on uh, Monday, um, getting this osprey as it's doing that dive, right? So first thing, you got to be able to make sure you can get the bird in. Um, if you've got like a fixed 300 millimeter, it's really hard. Then you got to be able to follow the action. You've got to make sure everything is sharp in there. Um, it takes practice to be able to do those those types of things. It's a, it's a shot that's not easy. So get out there and play around with the gulls or the pigeons. Um, to be able to get the shot that he again got on Monday with these talons coming in. I update my programs all the time. So um, even if you've seen my Wabi Sabi presentation, if you've seen it three times, there's always new pictures that are in our uh, programs. So I couldn't help but put in a couple um, new. I had this program, um, you know, uh, finished, but then, um, you know, a new version and then a new version. So I think I've uh, re redone this program a couple of times, um, including adding the pictures from, from Monday that are in here as well. Um, being able to get the Osprey dive in and getting this fish just so cool look at the shake after it's gotten this fish it's got to get all of that water off its wings so we can get the lift off and take it back to the the nest where the female is waiting in there um, sometimes they will actually do a victory lap it's a riot this one here he had tried to get a couple of fish and when he got this one he looked at me like I got it. Did you get it? Did you get the picture? I got the fish. So, you know, it was just kind of comical, right? You know, he was actually posing for the, the camera in there. But you've got to get out and just, you know, take lots of pictures and take more pictures. There's a famous quote that says your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. That was a film quote. That was not a digital quote. So it's many, many more in there to be able to do this. You've got to be able to keep the bird in your camera. you got to get an idea of bird behaviors. How fast or how slow does a bird move? Does a bird move with a prediction or does it move erratic? If you're trying to take a picture of a turn or an ibis, like they'll just go and then they'll go like upside down and you're like, where'd the bird go? So you have to learn bird behaviors as well. There's lots of things you can do to improve your bird photography for sure. Um, Thinking about your backgrounds, again, I'm tending to, you know, think about our backgrounds even before I take it, but also think about your angles. A lot of times we want to be at eye level with our subject. So we have LCDs that can get down low. We have uh, skimmers and platypods that can get down low. Um, you could be like Tom and you can just lie down on the ground and get really low. You can see this little bird um, and be able to now be eye level. The background just goes whoosh out of the, out of the picture. So that's something that can be fun. What do you do when you go to the beach. Maybe you don't have a long lens. Um, you have to then learn patience. There was a question asked, well, what if I don't have the top of the line camera? The top of the line lens was one of the questions. Then you have to have top of the line patience. So when you go to the beach, all the little birds are going to skedaddle out of there. But if you're there, before they were there, they're just going to walk by you to the point where you're going to be so close that you can't even focus on them. So if you, um, you know, can't afford at this point in your life, the top of the line camera, the top of the line lens, then you've got to invest in some patience as well. Um, get outside where there's bad weather. If it's snowing outside, be outside. Grackles, look at the colors in those grackles. Not my favorite bird on a dull day. They just kind of look black. And yet he's got purple and he's got blue and green and all these colors in there. Get out there when it's snowing. Get out there when it's raining. Again, a starling. Look at the colors that are in the starling. Um, here we've got a little finch that's out there. And Tom photographed him in the bad weather little uh, hairy wood, uh, downy woodpecker um, out there and again out in the snow. I'm trying to photograph this um, hawk in the rain. Our cameras are weather sealed. We will cry uncle ever well before our cameras. A uh, catbird out there in the rain that Tom photographed. The color saturation when it's raining is phenomenal. Um, if you want to get a who, you know, watch the video of how they test to be able to show that this camera is IP53 rated. Now, most of the cameras nowadays are weather sealed. Um, ours just happens to be IP53 rated. So we go out all day in the rain, no rain covers, no worries. We will always cry uncle before our cameras um, give in at, at all. But the color saturation, look at the top if you're out there in the rain versus out there just even on an overcast day. What a difference it actually makes. So gear, definitely that's always a tough one, right? Who wants more gear? Um, if you want to learn your existing gear or there's that famous little 
I don't know if it's a far side, but it's a mimic on far side. And they have the line for new gear and then they have the line for learning your existing gear, right? Most people want new gear, but you have to practice with that gear. Take a class with somebody, go out to, again, photograph the pigeons or photograph the gulls. You know, I want gear, I want gear, you know, me too, me too. Um, it is fun to get new gear. Um, this lens, when I received it, I think I super glued it to my camera. It changed my bird photography because of the 1.25x teleconverter that was in there. Um, but we knew when it was announced and we saved up for it because it was something that we knew would revolutionize our photography. And the subject detection that is present in the EM1X and in the OM1 and in many of the other models of cameras now, we have wonderful subject detection where we can actually go and turn on our bird detection or mammal detection or other subject detection. And it's just phenomenal. Um, I did a one-on-one -on -one with somebody who was actually wanting to do bird photography. And they also um, were going down to the Smokies um, to be able to photograph landscapes. And on the front lens with the LFN button, we put their subject detection on. And accidentally, she kept hitting it. And she kept seeing the little cat, the little mammal sign come up. And she was like, that cat is back. The cat is back. And everybody else is out there on this overlook in the Smokies going, what cat? There's no cat here. So she kept turning, accidentally turning her subject detection on here. But when you turn it on because you want to use it, it's phenomenal what you can do. But how do you find things, right? Maybe you bought the 300 millimeter and you go, how do I actually find things? Um, think about that little knob that is on there. That can be used as a sight. So line that up first when you're trying to be able to, um, to photograph. I know some people buy the 100 to 400 and the 300, and then they end up using the 100 to 400, and they use it as a crutch. They're going out to 100, and they're going into 400. By that time, like the bird is gone, like you're losing time. Learn how to use it just at 400. You got the 300, it's going to be a faster lens because it's, it's an F4 lens. What mode are you going to be actually shooting in? Um, we were with somebody a few weeks ago and they were on single. We were photographing these really fast moving birds. And it was a younger person with a Canon Rebel. And I'm like, put it on burst mode. And they're like, what's burst mode? I'm like, many frames a second rather than just one frame per second, right? So one frame a second is going, you know, um, going to be great for landscape type images. But put it on burst mode. If you have a silent burst mode, it's even going to be faster or for us, SH2 is going to be the best mode to be able to do. So don't put it on just one picture at a time. Make sure you at least have it on one of the sequentials, either the sequential sequential silent or the SH2 that's going to be in there. Tom and I use SH2 the vast majority of the the time. There might be a time where a bird is really hidden. Um, he had an interesting bird out in our backyard that we'd never seen before. And there was a lot of things um, where he really couldn't get a good picture. We just kind of wanted a record picture because it was the first time in our yard. That might be a time to go to, to single and turn off all the, the tracking. And I know that was one of the questions too, um, you know, using um, the, the tracking. I use SH2 um, with bird detection, with tracking 99% of the time. I would say Tom probably uses it 90% of the time when he's doing things like the osprey diving into the water, he'll often turn off um, some of that because as the bird goes underneath the water, it can lose it. So he feels um, he's a little bit faster on there. So we, we vary just a little bit within there, but the technology is just phenomenal. Think about what you also want to set your target to be. Do you want it to be on a single point? Do you want it to be on a large point? Do you want it to be on an all point? Well, there's times for each of those. On an all point might be when you have a bird that's up there in the sky and there's nothing else around. But if you have multiple birds, you want to kind of put it on large or middle or cross or single because you want it to be on the bird that you're interested in. Maybe you have a grackle and you also have a red-bellied woodpecker and you're only interested in when the red-bellied woodpecker comes in. You want to make sure then you wouldn't have it on all or large in that particular case. So think about your situation and when you might need to be able to put it on different target points and when to move those target points around versus letting the AI technology kind of take over as well. If I'm photographing a bird that is on the water like a loon, I can actually set up a custom target mode where I just have that little sliver that would be what I'd be using for focusing. And then I have one of my custom modes and almost all cameras nowadays, even the um, EM10 have my sets, uh, have custom modes. So I have C1 is like bird on a stick. 
And then C2 is bird in the sky, you know, like birds in flight. C3 is my pro capture. So have different scenarios of things that you photograph the most in that particular case. So I have here kind of my birds on a stick type thing. So that would be my C1, basically a bird that either isn't, you know, moving fast or a bird that maybe has things that are obstructing it. Um, they don't always uh, build their nest in the most uh, easy to be able to see places versus my birds in flight. Now I'm going to have that on C2. That's going to be where I have more of a larger focus uh, pad or maybe all, all of them going to be in there as well. Um, know your birds. Know, you know, join the local bird club, read a bird book, um, get the Merlin app, um, you know, be able to identify birds and learn more about bird behavior. The more you learn about bird behavior, the more you can kind of predict what they're going to be able to do. It's sometimes a year there's going to be birds that are going after certain fish. Sometimes a Year, there's going to be this eagle trying to be able to get fodder for his his nest going down and trying to be able to get the fish out of the out of the rivers well what rivers are they fishing in um in a couple of weeks we're doing um and eagles and herons and eagle eagles egrets and herons workshop so we know like where those birds are going to be when to be able to have everybody get access to things like this um you know to be able to have them right after they've caught that fish and they do that kind of you know swing by and that victory lap that they actually do um sometimes you know coming right at you we're doing a workshop with wild side tours in may up in canada we'll be photographing some of these wonderful raptors that are up there and having some fun with them as well know about the wind Birds are going to face into the wind. Um, so you want your shadow to be facing your subject and you want basically the wind. If this wind was going the other direction, you'd only have butts. You wouldn't have black skimmer heads and it wouldn't be very interesting to photograph them from the other end. Um, know something about the male and female. So this is a schmoo. We've got the male on the left and the female on the right. So know something about them, like pick up a Sibley's book. Um, there's a book called um, How to Be a Bird, and it's a pretty neat David Sibley book. We own the book, and we've also listened to the book on tape as well. Um, wood ducks, you know, we've got a male and a female with different colorations that are going on in the breeding plumage that's going on. This bird here, what's the matter with him? Is he gargling? Is he sick? No, he's calling in a mate. If she comes over to him, get ready. They're going to mate. You got to be ready. So knowing some of the, the behaviors and kind of learning about birds is going to enhance your bird photography. This one here, he was wooing her, right? He definitely is like, hey, come hither. So again, knowing some of the bird behaviors is going to help you a lot. Knowing that your yellow crowned night heron is going to go down low. He's going to put up his feathers and then he's going to go his neck up high means that maybe you won't uh, go in too tight and you're going to miss the action when he stretches out his neck. So learn about bird behaviors. Um, the osprey, he's going to bring in a stick. And if she likes the stick, then they might be mating next. So being aware at the beginning of the season that he's bringing her sticks and he's hoping that she's going to accept those sticks, um, knowing that he's going to be bringing in grasses, he's going to be bringing in all kinds of nesting material for her. Um, his job is to be able to bring in a fish. He's supposed to eat the head and bring her the rest of the body. We watched some pairs over and over and over again. And three years ago, um, the female to this male lost her mate. And so she had a brand new mate and he was young and he didn't know that he was supposed to eat just the head. And she would be over there squawking and, you know, like in trying to get him to understand that he's only supposed to eat the head and bring her second year. He finally got the, the message and he's bringing her just the, the fish and eat, just eating the head. So now you can see he finally figured out and look at his crop. His crop is all full of food, right? He's eating the head and he's bringing her the, the rest of it. Now, when he is going to bring her that he's going to take off next. So, you know, be aware. Don't just like, oh, I got the picture. Now you're chimping and looking at the back of your camera and you're going to miss the next shot because he's going to go over and hang out now. He's done his fishing. He's brought home dinner. He's brought home the bacon. He's just going to sit and hang out now and he's just going to look around. And so you have an opportunity to be able to photograph, you know, him separately as well. And the chicks get bigger. You can see the orange eye on the chick. Um, lots of feeding that's going to be going on. They're hungry. They're going to have to be fed all the time. So find out where those nests are and kind of make sure you're there when they're going to be fed. Any of the herons, after they eat that big fish, don't stop. Again, your, your, your gut instinct is to stop and then chimp and look at the back of the camera. They're going to take a drink. 99 out of 100 times, they're going to take a drink to wash down that fish that they just ate. Looking at the breeding behavior that's going on here as well. So, so much fun for this. Um, being able to follow them as they lay their eggs. So we watch them doing their breeding, laying their eggs, having the little, oh my God, they're like Muppets. 
Um, and then when they grew up, oh my God, look at the size of that mouth. <laughs> um, wait, this is a immature bird. So again, it might be easy to be able to uh, identify a yellow crown versus a black crown night heron when you're looking at the adult. Much harder to be able to look at it when you're looking at this and going, oh, this is a black crown night heron immature. It's not a yellow night crown immature. Um, this is a little blue heron, and Tom caught him just as he was doing his preening. Wonderful image, great background on here. But this is an immature, this is actually a molting little blue heron, right? So little blue herons are white, and then they molt, and then they look like this, and then they become <laughs> little blue herons. So knowing some of those, those birds that are going on there as well. Um, the breeding plumage, looking at the colors, knowing, wait a minute, he hasn't laid, you know, eggs yet, or, you know, she hasn't laid, the pair hasn't laid eggs yet, because they'll lose that coloration as soon as they lay their eggs. Um, you know, the, the goldfinches right now, with that wonderful coloration that we've got, just a few weeks ago, they were dull, now they're vibrant. The anhinga, again, you can tell what stage they're at, look at that coloration that's going on, so you know, have they laid their eggs or not, even if you can't see the eggs. Um, the green lures of the egret, he's trying to attract a mate and his lures are saying that not only, um, you know, he's in full breeding, um, you know, everything ready to go here. Thinking about backgrounds too. find a day where you have light up against them and then a, you can just let the background go darker and then you don't have to have a distracting background going on here. The turkey vultures and the um, things as well, thinking about finding a spot where the light is on them. And yet you have um, a not distracting background because the background is dark at that particular time of day. Or go the opposite. Go on a white sky day and you can get a white on white and do a high key type of image. In this case, you don't even mind if the sky is blinking. Blinkies are typically bad, but not for high key photography. You can kind of make fine art images if you do a real high key day. So sometimes people look and go, oh, it's cloudy outside. I'm not going. No, if it's raining, snowing, if it's a high, you know, cloudy day, still go out there. Um, be able to position yourself early in the morning or late in the day um, and then just bump up your white balance to make it a little bit warmer and you can even enhance that color that's coming in at sunrise or sunset. Have a little fun putting the sun as it's coming right up behind the wood stork here. Um, thinking about your backgrounds, this little guy here, it was a nice little green background, but two steps over, and now we could have his his little mate at a different color background. So these are brothers. Um, there's different morphs of screech owls. We have the gray morph and we have the, the red morph, but just a couple steps over and the background changed so differently. Ibises can look actually black with no color, but you get them in the right light and they're burgundy and green. And how cool is that? Portraits are cool if you can kind of wait and be patient and get up close, but getting doing something is even better. Getting some action shots that are going on. This one here, she's like, hmm, have kids, they said. It'd be fun, they say. So she's kind of standing over these as the two of them are fighting there. Um, this little guy here, he's just kind of standing. It'd be nice if he was actually kind of doing something. Oh, my God. Then he sees her. All of a sudden, his plume goes up on his head and his feathers go out. Then he starts, uh, oh, wait, no, we don't want a headless bird. Watch out for headless birds. Like we get so excited sometimes that we just keep shooting, even though now we have a headless bird. No, wait for them to actually do something more interesting. So again, patience and timing, watching behaviors, knowing when not to take a picture, when they're walking away from you, flying away from you, when you don't have a head, when you just got butts. At the beginning of the season, I take a few butt shots. I take a few headless bird shots because I'm so excited after having a winter with no birds. And then I get it out of my system and I'm like, no, don't press the shutter. Um, knowing that a uh, great blue heron is going to be patient and waiting for that fish. Little um, green herons, they are so much fun and they're shapeshifters and they could sit there for an hour being patient. And then all of a sudden they'll put something into the water and use it as a little lure for the fish and they'll stick out their neck. Um, you can watch them for hours and hours and hours in all different shapes, all different activities that are going on in here. And, oh, you got a dragonfly. So it's kind of fun to be able to watch them. Um, in the morning, they're going to use this like, you know, little sun reflectors. Remember from the 70s where people used to use aluminum sun reflectors to be able to get tan. They're going to use that radiant heat. So watch your herons and your egrets in the morning and they'll do this really strange pose. Black skimmers. 
They have the one uh, jaw that is so different length and shape than the other one. So watch those behaviors. Watch them as they're going fishing. Watch them what they're doing with that fish afterward because they're bringing it back to their chicks. They have to then come in time and time and time again to be able to bring them. So you're going to be able to get lots of flight shots. You're going to get lots of fishing shots. Getting that catch light's important. So again, making sure the sun is behind you, your sun is facing them so you get the catch light in their eye getting nice shadows as they're flying around, getting and chasing each other. No, you're too near me. Get away from me. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't want your nest near my nest. I'm right? um, getting them fishing. You have to be patient. You got to practice. First thing you got to be able to do is keep them in the frame. So again, those pigeons or those gulls are going to be important to be able to practice on, you know, watching them feeding their, their young. Same with the oyster catchers. They usually have their young first, and it's so much fun because they're very, very chatty, very talkative, and they're very, very patient with raising their young. They eat, they feed, and they just constantly are with them all the time, and it can be so much fun. And you hear them go by, dee, 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 and they're just so chatty, so much fun. They make a lot of noise on the beach. Um, you can they 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 seem to enjoy other genera like osprey tend to be like, no, stay away. Um, oyster catchers are always like. Hop. Hey, good to see you. And they're always really, really chatty. So it's a lot of fun to be able to get out there with them. Get out there early in the morning or late at the end of the day and get those colors. So Tom did this with kind of this backlighting from the sunset going on here. Again, like thinking about, you know, your technologies. Part of the problem is our brain is like, oh my God, the bird is filling the frame. And then we get home and we go, the bird is small. What happened? Who shrunk the bird? So it's kind of that objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Birds in the camera are smaller than they appear. This happens all the time. So one of the things you can do is you want to try to fill your frame with your bird. What do you do when your bird is small? You shouldn't be taking it if it's really, really small. There's no point if it's really, really far away. You just got to be patient and try to be able to wait for it to be able to come closer. So you can actually change your grid when you're doing birding. Instead of maybe no grid or a lot of people do the rule of thirds grid, do a 24 grid. So now if your bird doesn't fill up at least one of those, just keep tracking it. Get used to keeping it in the viewfinder, but don't actually take the picture. All right, now it's starting to get a little bit bigger. Now it's getting a little bit bigger. Okay, now it's actually kind of filling up one of those boxes. Now you could kind of trip the shutter so you can kind of get used to it and then wait until it comes in, you know, larger. A lot of times I'm just tracking it when it's smaller and then I wait until it actually comes in larger before I actually trip the shutter. And sometimes a small bird can be fun. So this is a Photoshopped um, version. This is a multiplicity where I had one bird and it's doing lots of different things. So sometimes, you know, I'm kind of having fun. The kingfisher's far away. He's small. Even though he's not filling the frame, I might take it because then I can actually do a sequence and watch the way his feathers go and have a little bit of fun. But generally, if it's not filling at least one of those boxes, I'm not going to take it. Um, this one here, the crow was bothering his eagle to no end. Um, um, they were really small in the frame, but I thought this is just too cool a behavior. Like the behavior is more important than like the size or resolution at that point because it tells a story. Um, this Harrier here, Tom's taking a lot of great Harrier pictures, full frame. This little guy that I got was so far out, but I'm like, you know what? The way he came in, he's swooping down, he's looking for voles. I'm going to tell a story with that. And so occasionally you can kind of break the rule. Or maybe you want to tell the story and you want the bird to be small intentionally. So this eagle flies out, all the pintail ducks fly off because they don't want to be lunch. That case, I don't mind that the bird is small because it's telling a story. You have to learn kind of patience and anticipate behavior. But that's, again, where our computational technologies can help. So peregrine falcons can fly at over 240 miles an hour. They take off so fast. They can take off like Batman and just go on, go on, go on. So you're waiting and you're waiting. You don't know when he's going to take off. And then by the time your brain sees it and registers, it's too late. And that's where the pro capture technology can really help immensely as well. So I have my finger pressed halfway on the shutter. It is keeping pictures in memory, constantly refreshing those. If I never take a picture, those images are deleted. But if I press the shutter, now all the pictures be 
before I tripped the shutter or kept, and I'm always getting that decisive moment. So I'm always getting those those shots rather than missing those shots as well. So waiting for this little guy to take off, like you could wait half an hour for a green heron. So waiting for this little guy to take off, you could see I'm waiting, 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 waiting. And then when I finally trip the, the shutter, I have all of that sequence in there that I probably would have missed. I probably would have just gotten that last shot that's in there. So play around with Pro Capture. Have a lot of, of, of fun doing that. If you have kids in your family, have them do some water balloons, pop some balloons, and practice in your yard. You don't even need a bird to be able to practice Pro Capture on. Um, Tom did this one on Sunday. This um, um, little bird was just sitting here on this wonderful little snag, and he's got Pro Capture on. He's just waiting. He knows eventually that bird is going to fly off to either defend his territory or to try to woo a female in. And so by having it on Pro Capture, again, it's constantly recycling. And as soon as he trips the shutter, it gets the pictures before he tripped the shutter as well as the ones afterward there. So Pro Capture is just constantly keeping those pictures in memory. Um, for us, they're full-size raw pictures, um, and you can just kind of keep your finger down, and you can be at 50 frames a second or 120 frames per second, and you're just going to be able to get those decisive moments going on there. So again, the moment you want to capture, and then by the time you trip the shutter, you're already like way out there, and this is actually going to keep those pictures in memory and then record them as soon as you trip the shutter down. Down on there so it allows you to get that decisive moment and not miss those shots that are in there waiting for a green heron you could wait a half an hour and it might not move at all and then boom he goes and oh you missed it now you don't have to to miss that action this little guy here was an immature uh, red tailed hawk we knew he was going to take off because more and more people were kind of seeing that he was there um have it on pro capture i'm hand holding and then boom he flies off get all these the sequence of pictures um, Tom did these with the puffins, same type of thing, waiting for them to come in, waiting for them to be able to land, waiting for them to be able to take off. You don't know exactly when they're going to be able to take off. Um, same with the little um, short-eared owls. You know this little guy's going to come over and land, so I'm now focused on the post that I know he's going to land on. Boom, he's down. I've already got my, my, my camera poised and focused on the post. So as soon as he lands, I've got that pro capture going on there as well. This little guy's coming in, same type of thing. Boom, he lands. Now, eventually, he's going to take off again. He's got to go search for more voles. So pro capture, pro capture, pro capture. Boom, he's off. You get that, that shot as well. So the pro capture technology really helps you quite a bit to be able to, you don't know exactly um, when they're going to be able to go off but boom he's off and then you've got that shot in there so you've got to be able to practice get that dunk get that fish you know all of that pro capture is great it can be used for other things besides birds like i mentioned balloons uh filled with water um this is one of my pet chameleons um so he's going after a little um, hornworm in this case um how do you wait boom it's gonna go out so so fast my Pac-Man frog going after the same uh, type of hornworm. And he sat there and he sat there and he sat there and he sat there. 20 minutes later, he's still sitting there. He's contemplating. And then, boom, he goes. And then, oh, seeing the unseen. I had no idea that his tongue folded out backward. I'm like, how cool is that? I've owned this guy for four years and not until pro capture did I notice that his tongue is in and folds out. <laughs> So that's what photography really should be is fun. So it's one of these things that enjoy your photography, like be a little fun with it. I bought these little rubber books and I had fun with my chameleon doing this, you know, getting in really close on this, getting, you know, the neck where it starts to look like a dinosaur or the tail, being able to go out in the rain, take pictures of the spring flowers and then going in a little bit closer and a little bit closer, this one looks like a humpback whale breaching with, you know, barnacles on him. Dandelions are growing in our yard right now. Don't think of them as weeds. They're good. They're one of the first pollinators for our bees. Try to keep your yard at least no mow May, right? So that's the idea is at least wait till all the pollinators have had a chance to replenish and then wait till June to mow your lawn. Let this stuff, you know, go until you've got lots of fodder to be able to photograph. Have fun, again, with colors and things that are simple. Doesn't all have to be computational technology and gear. Look for things that kind of opposite ends of the color wheel, the red against the green. And look at the little snails have left trails. Do, 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 do. They've left trails on the car door itself. Wait for a dragonfly to come and land, and it will come back again and again and again. You don't have to chase them. They'll come back to that exact same spot. Put your camera down low. Flip out the LCD. And now you have daffodil from a chipmunk's point of view. 
Get those color combinations. Look for your backgrounds first. Have fun. Enjoy it all. Tom made me uh, this picture for Valentine's Day. So this is a 2X macro magnification and just fun. So I hope this whet your appetite. Um, I, I know that Tom has been answering questions away in the chat. Um, I have seen most of the questions come through in the, the chat here. I will look through it again um, for um, additional questions to make sure there weren't um, any that I did um, miss. Um, so there were questions about making great bird pictures um, with a with a low budget camera. So again, then you know your your practice is going to be very important. Your patience is going to be very important. Um, I did talk about um, CAF and CAF tracking. Um, best setting for star trails. Um, it depends on how much ambient light you have. So if I am in San Francisco or New York City, um, I need to be at a half a second and then I'm just going to let the new light come in and new light come in. If I am in Connecticut, it's probably going to be around 20 seconds because we have a little bit of light pollution, but not where a big city would have it. If I am up in the middle of the Adirondacks, I'm probably going to be more at 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Let that first uh, ambient light, and you can do that one just really easily just you know you can do it on shutter priority you can do it on manual just kind of see like how much light is kind of coming in on that first picture am i getting too much light pollution too much ambient light and then just let it stack and let it go and then that refresh rate you'll just see it keep refreshing over and over and over again um Settings for bird photography. So shutter speed, shutter speed, shutter speed. Um, the aperture really doesn't matter. The ISO really doesn't matter unless the bird is like, you know, like bird on a stick right in front of you. Um, if your shutter speed isn't fast enough, the aperture and the ISO become irrelevant. So the speed of the birds kind of, kind of dictate that. Um, one one thousandth of a second, one two thousandth of a second is generally the thing that I worry about the most. Whatever I need to get to um, that shutter speed is going to be the most important thing. Um, if your image is, um, you know, low ISO, but your bird isn't in focus, then it doesn't matter what the ISO was because it's not a keeper picture. Um, exposed to the right and you'll have uh, less less noise. Um, I do do a lot of one-on-ones with people to um, do a basic workflow as far as being able to optimize uh, pictures. That's probably one of the most common ones that I, that I do as well. Um, Oh, a lunar eclipse. So a lunar eclipse, um, there you've got to do the full gamut. When the moon is bright, you're going to kind of spot meter on the moon. As the moon gets duller and duller and duller, you've got to allow more for like your 20 or 30 second exposure, just like you would for stars as well. Um, I talked about the 7 to 14. Um, trigger focus stacking. Um the phone, uh, the OI Share app should work. Um, if you have an OM1, we love the wireless remote. Both of us have the wireless remote. We actually bought a lanyard. We carry it around our neck. Um, ah, yes, Cindy, hooked on wabi sabi and paradoia and birds. You're you're just going to town with Olympus there. Um, pictures of the Milky Way. So um, in that particular case, what you're most worried about is the earth is moving. So if your exposure is open too long, you're going to get blurry Milky Way. So a fast lens is really important in that particular scenario. Photopills actually has a little um, thing that puts in, you put in your camera, you put in your lens, you put in your aperture, and it'll tell you what the maximum number of seconds you can be open. We're generally in the 15 to 20 second um, range in there. Um, we occasionally have, we have the move, shoot, move tracker. There are advantages to using a tracker, but you have to carry it. You have to set it up. So we, even though there are advantages, we don't always use it. Um, we kind of, yeah, I, I don't know. You have to kind of know it's going to be a clear night. We have a lot of nights where, you know, we're not sure if it's going to be a good night or a bad night. Um, let's see. Um, any tips for holding the camera steady. Um, you know, thinking about your breathing, thinking about pressing the shutter. Um, if you're holding it, kind of thinking about like your elbows in and up to your forehead for birds. But I do a lot of handheld where I'm actually holding it with one hand and the LCD is out and I'm holding it down um, low and the image stabilization's pretty, pretty good. Um, to make an image of a best angle. So you want your shadow facing toward the bird. 
Um, you want the bird facing toward you and you want to make sure the head angle isn't facing away from you. You want to make sure there's a catch light in the eye. Um, again, practice on those pigeons or practice on those, those gulls as well. Um, shutter speed is most important. Don't worry about aperture. Uh, uh, the bird is usually going to be far enough away that the aperture might not matter, or maybe just the tips of the wings won't be um, sharp. But to me, it's the beak and the eyes. Um, that's where I want my sharpness to be in there. Um, already talked about water droplets, talked about tripod. Um, a flower app. So let's see. Um, actually, our phones now identify most of the flowers. It's kind of crazy. If you take a picture with your my iPhone, um, then you press the little, there's an I, like a, a letter I, um, it'll give you the information. Um, but there is a plant snap app that I do use as well. Um, I use Photo Sleuth, Bird ID, Merlin, and Plant Snap. Um battery life with pro capture pro capture is going to take more battery but it's worth it just buy another battery <laughs> um the pro capture you'll just get so many more decisive moments it's worth it um how many images do you set for pre on the pro capture depends on the bird if the bird is fast you need more um, if the bird is just a bigger, slower moving bird, you might be able to move it more toward the five range. I generally have it around 12 on a general day, but it does depend on the bird and the bird's movement and what the bird is doing as well. Um, any way to use a trigger with Pro Capture? Um, yeah, the remote works with Pro Capture. The wireless remote does work. Um, Oh, the autofocus is plenty fast. Um, I was just photographing turns. These turns were crazy. They were going every which way. And I, the, the AI keeps up with it. Just amazing. So, yes, I have no problem with, with flying birds. Um, and then Tom was obviously answering other questions um, as well. But, um, you know, please um, do, you know, keep in touch with us. We'd love to be able to hear from people. Um, if you do have an additional question, you know, contact us. Um, like I said, we do workshops. We lead workshops for Wild Side. We've got a big bird workshop coming up in May with them um, for raptors. Uh, we do one-on-ones via Zoom all over the world. Um, I heard somebody's even on from New, New Zealand, so we can still do a one-on-one -on -one there. I'm a night owl, so even the time zone doesn't uh, affect us too much. Um, I do a lot of things on the West Coast, um, so um, I love the fact that uh, a lot of their programs are starting 9 o'clock my time because I'm just kind of ramping up and, <laughs> and Tom's ramping down. So um, we also do um, a variety of different um, workshops as, as groups as well. We love to have people come and inspire people to be able to do different, different things as well. So um, on that note, I'm going to say thank you for joining us and hanging around. And I hope that my goal was to give you both simple things to inspire you and technical things to inspire you as well. So thank you.